Orange Force. Um, and he will introduce us to a crowdsourced bathymetry project that he has been working on in the Great Lakes with the Great Lakes Observing System. Um, so take it away. Great, thank you very much for that uh, for that intro, uh, Lyndon. If you just bear with me for a moment, I'll uh, I'll share a screen and uh, and get started on uh, on my presentation here. And Lyndon, just want to confirm you can see. Yep, we can see it. Great, thanks, uh, thanks everyone. Again, uh, my name is Derek Niles. I'm the president uh, of Orange Force Marine, a small marine services business up in uh, southwestern Ontario on, on Lake Erie uh, in Great Lakes in, in Canada. Um, our presentation here, a little bit to talk about uh, some, some partnership we've been doing with the Great Lakes Observing System, or GLOSE, and some initiatives that, uh, that we've uh, undertaken in regards to the crowdsource bathymetry space. Uh, so we'll go over what that Smart Great Lakes initiative is and, and, and uh, Lake Bed 2030 in regards to uh, GLOSE's engagement. We'll talk about crowdsource bathymetry and why we think that's a viable tool uh, here to, to help uh, with the Lake Bed 2030 initiative. We'll talk about uh, OF, uh, Orange Force Marine or OFM, uh, our developed uh, kit that we're, we're, we're calling the Muscle, um, and, uh, and some of the system ar architecture, some project stages, and, and some next steps for, for how we see the, uh, the project uh, progressing. Uh, so the Smart Great Lakes initiative, uh, initiative from, from, from GLOSS, uh, which consists of multiple sensors uh, and buoys and, and, and equipment throughout the Great Lakes, uh, providing um, public data on the status of the lakes and whether that's from water temperatures to salinity, uh, all of that data is being collected in near real time and transmitted ashore and then onward uh, broadcasted to, into the, the forthcoming Seagull platform uh, from uh, via Great Lakes Observing System in the name of uh, citizen science and, and, and engagement of, uh, of different resources on that front. One of the newer elements uh, that, uh, that we're working towards under, uh, under Seagull is the bath bathymetric layer, uh, where we try to, uh, to improve the, the, the image quality on, uh, on, on the Great Lakes seabed. Uh, so Lake Bed 2030's initiative that's an extension of Seabed 2030, but just focused solely in the, in the Great Lakes of, uh, of North America. And only 6% of those Great Lakes have been surveyed to any degree of accuracy, uh, and often between 100 and 2,500 meters between soundings with surveys done in the, in the 50s and 60s. So, uh, so that high resolution map uh, certainly isn't there. Um, to, to, be, to, to do that properly, if you will, in, in regards to traditional survey means using multi-beam echo sound or LIDAR or satellite-derived bathymetry, uh, we're looking at a forecasted cost between $130 and $200 million uh, to, to execute that uh, before 2030. And uh, our project is, is looking at crowdsource bathymetry as an alternative or perhaps an, uh, an additional option to force multiply the number of uh, resources that are out there, contributing data points. Uh, to uh, to Lake Bed 2030 to help build that uh, that larger map. So uh, just a, a graphical representation here uh, of of the value of crowdsourced bathymetry. When we can start to force multiply vessels, we can get greater area coverage to help fill in the gaps, if you will, or map the gaps uh, for those uh, for those different spaces and. You know, uh, an example on the graphic on the on the left shows uh, shows multiple vessels in, in in southern Europe, whereas we're seeing some high traffic areas on the right for for Lake Erie on the top image, uh, which is my neck of the woods, and, and Lake Ontario uh, for the south parts. And those are just straight commercial shipping, let alone a lot of the recreational shipping or fishing fleets or, or other government vessels that are that are plying. So you can start to see the value uh, of piggybacking onto uh, existing vessel operations. And so, you know, one of the key items is, is, to, is to be able to collect that bathymetric data um, by the public uh, or distributed sources, not necessarily specialized survey vessels. And, and we want to be able to, to piggyback on that existing vessel, you know, but do so in, in a way that's non-interference uh, non um, and, uh, and uses the organics, uh, the, the vessel's organic sensors, as opposed to outfitting with, um, with, other, um, with other equipment. The challenge has always been, whether from, from a survey perspective or, or in our case, um, crowdsource bathymetry, getting that data off of the vessel. How do we get that ashore um, in a situation uh, to, to be able to, to help that map without a lot of user interface or user requirements? And we've, we've developed that solution. So uh, our muscle kit, um, uh, we've developed uh, the, the overarching assembly and software, and you'll see a bit of a graphic for, for one of our units on, on the right-hand side, designed to be completely hands-off, uh, automated and non-intrusive to the, to the vessel operator. 
truly plug and play. And one of the things that we've done differently with our solution set is, is to engage on the uh, National Marine Electronics Association or NEMA uh, 2000 protocol uh, to be able to, to plug right into those uh, existing navigation suites on the vessels. We, uh, we build in an integrated inertial measurement unit or, uh, to, to, to measure motion and an integral GPS uh, receiver uh, in the event that we don't have that on board the vessel. The real challenge, I suppose the real uh, uh, value add here is our Wi-Fi and cellular connectivity that allows us to, to transmit that data ashore in what we're calling near real time. So generally every about six minutes, we're seeing a transmission of recorded data uh, ashore when, in, uh, when on Wi-Fi or, uh, or cellular range here in the Great Lakes. Uh, alternatively, we can also store that, collect the data on board uh, for transmission when the vessel returns to shore or returns to cellular range. Muscle kit. Um, we configure that to, before it goes out to, to, to the particulars of the vessel and, and sort it out. We want to I, place that, uh, that equipment in an ideal location uh, for both cellular uh, service, GPS reception, and for, and for correct orientation for the, uh, for the IMU. Designed to be non-permanent, we want to put these onto units, saturate an area with their sailings, and then, and then shuffle them around to, to other, um, other vessels uh, to help uh, build uh, greater and greater uh, pieces of the map. Um, I, again, designed to plug and play into the existing electronic suite and integrate with those existing sen sensors. All that's required for our end users to measure the vessel offsets uh, uh, from, the, from the different devices. And it generally takes about less than an hour for, for that uh, particular installation. To give you a, a graphic overview, just to showcase how the system works, uh, we're taking soundings from the seabed by way of the organic vessel's uh, echo sounder. That depth of data is being transmitted over the NEMA 2000 bridge. Uh, and being logged by the parameter group numbers or PGNs uh, up to the data logger. At the same time, the IMU is measuring the vessel's motion and providing that uh, pitch, heave, roll, and yaw uh, to, uh, to the logger. And we're also capturing the, the GPS or GNSS sensor uh, to provide that, uh, that ongoing position. Data is uh, captured by the logger, broadcasted uh, and transmitted through a Wi-Fi or cellular router to a cloud uh, in the cloud ecosystem up to servers where we'll run some scripts to convert it into a, a file format that can be used elsewhere uh, in, through the uh, post-processing or, or hydrographic software packages. Uh, we can do that, uh, that cloud processing um, virtually, and then we can uh, decide how we want to articulate and, and, uh, and display that, uh, that data. Um, so that, that collection that, that, that occurs, occurs automatically whenever the system electronics is fired up. Or, or powered on, um, and we'll we'll log all that navigation data that that, that comes across. And while we're we're focusing on the CS uh, crowdsource bathymetry project, just on depths and positions, we can also capture the using the same muscle kit, capture a few other scientific elements as long as it's uh, broadcast on the NEMA network. We'll compress and encrypt it for 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 data security and to minimize some of those transmission costs. Transmit it ashore, put it to the servers, process it display it. And we've got a couple of different uh, conversions uh, to, in terms of CSV, G, uh, generic sensor format or, or XYZ type file formatting uh, for, uh, for, for post-processing. To give you a graphic, just to see what that some of that, uh, that process looks like, and this is a fairly busy slide, but we're starting in the vessel in the upper, upper left, putting that into our, our cloud-based bucket, conducting our, our, our de-encryption, decompressing, uh, code transmit, uh, translation, put it to the GSF or XYZ, back to our virtual machine where we can then transmit that file onward to NCEI um, uh, or DCVC uh, data centers or run that through our own processing to be able to generate uh, that, uh, that bag surface or, or high resolution surface and then put that into to display software for GIS software. Historically on the GLOSS project, we've been using Quimera, Fleeter Mouse and ArcGIS for, uh, for, those, um, for that, uh, that data display. Some examples uh, for what we've done in uh, in the lake for, for two of our initial prototype vessels, you can start to see some of the uh, some of the routing uh, that's been uh, that's been conducted and uh, and helping to to fill in those gaps uh, in in the areas of uh, in the case of uh, the upper right uh, Lake Erie and, and Lake Ontario um, for just two sample vessels on, on our project. Um, one of the things early on was we needed to confirm that what our what we're collecting is is, is in fact good data. And so we went out and, and, and referenced uh, some of the data that we collected against existing LIDAR, existing multi-beam uh, sample uh, data sets. And on the graphic on the lower, you can start to see crowdsource uh, bisymmetry uh, data that was collected through the muscle kit as compared to the, to the surface uh, analysis done against that LIDAR. And 
one of the outputs that we saw was uh, our, our, our equipment can actually get between three and 16 uh, centimeter vertical accuracy, uh, depending on the nature of the sensors, depending on the, uh, the effectiveness of the IMU and, and some other conditions. Um, the good news is we're getting pretty close to IHO order 1A, which is uh, sort of the goals and objectives for, for our project. Um, so, so to date, we've, we've installed two CSBs for, for, the, for the prototypes and proof of concepts, and that's been operational since April 2021. Um, we've, we've got 10 kits uh, installed in government research, academy, and first responder vessels uh, in August. And uh, we're looking for 50 to 100 CSB kits to be installed for a 2022 season to continue to build that map. To date, across those vessels, we've captured over, or sailed over 200 nautical miles and captured over 2.47 million, million, million data points um, already to, to add to the, to the grade map and, and, and help fill in uh, some of, uh, some of those, uh, those gaps across the Great Lakes uh, in support of Lake Bay 2030. So our next steps in the project is uh, obviously one of the things we're here today to talk uh, to talk to increase the exposure for for, for our initiative for our technology, and uh, uh, hopefully raise some funds uh, to do that, uh, and, and to so that we can expand scale, engage other vessels across the Great Lakes and potentially uh, internationally with uh, with the technology, um, automate the process um, to to be able to make it even closer from a ping to chart perspective. And then engage to be able to share our data uh, through through as an IHO trusted node, which um, which uh, Great Lakes Observing System now is, uh, to, to to share that onward as uh, in support of the larger Seabed 2030 um, project. So, how does a unit get involved, or how does a, as an organization get involved? I mean, identifying those organizations and vessels to us uh, will uh, will allow us to to to, to plug in, uh, engage them on the project, establish a sort of a user agreement with them. And then we'll work through the acquisition, installation, of the equipment, and then it's about uh, getting out there, applying the waters, uh, collecting the data, and, uh, and and putting that towards uh, our, our great maps. So on on that note, um, that concludes my uh, my brief presentation. And uh, Lyndon, happy to take uh, any questions that may have popped up. Fantastic, thank you, Derek. Um... Uh, chat box is open and available to any who would like to submit any questions, um, and then I will read them out to Derek. Um, in the meantime, I do have a question. Um, how many vessels are involved in this project, and is there um, a limit to what types of vessels can be involved, or what are we looking for here? So the, the ideal, the ideal uh, vessel would be one that, uh, that has a number of sailing a greater number of days because obviously the most amount of time that they spend on the water they're collecting data uh, that's the best option you know a sailboat that uh, a recreational sailboat that uh, that sails once every three weeks might not be a, an ideal candidate whereas your commercial vessel or your government vessel that's out conducting research day in and day out are our prime candidates the second piece becomes is where are they located within the areas and, and do we have good coverage in that area or uh, do we want to enhance that so sailing often, sailing in particular areas where we have gaps, uh, and then you know equipment suitability is another is another factor, right? Does the vessel have some modern, relatively modern electronics on that? Can we plug into it? What's the quality of their sensors, and what's the vessel um, like itself? Uh, fairly stable, a good platform for capturing, uh, along with its operational parameters. And so you know those are the sorts of criteria that we're looking for, and and that can range anywhere from you know, heavy use recreational um, vehicles from or, or vessels from a fishing charter, commercial fisheries, um, you know, first responder, uh, emergency government uh, science vessels, academic research vessels, all the way up to our um, our, our larger commercial uh, commercial vessels that will that will ply the lakes. So those are the sort of an, an ideal situation for us uh, here in here in the Great Lakes and and, and ideal candidates. Um, the other the other question you had was um, in regards to sorry I guess I forgot your other question Linda um, but those are the type of candidates that we're looking for. Perfect, thank you. And then we also have a question from Jamie O. How are you promoting this? How are you getting vessels to know they can participate? 
Yeah, this is great. I mean, awareness on, on seabed 2030 is sort of the first step. And then awareness for lake bed 2030 is, is the next step uh, for us, uh, at least in the Great Lakes. And then it's about, okay, what options do we have? Right. There are there are some organizations that would want to engage with the different technologies, multi-beam, LIDAR, satellite derived. And then there are others that have a fleet out there that are that are out there constantly sailing and engagement. So that's one of the functions that we have over the over the winter months. And, and it's about getting the word out about you know, why why do we want to map the gaps? Why do we want to, to map that so for an awareness campaign for the for the why? And then the second piece becomes here's how you can plug in and here's the option. And so uh, you know, at, at this stage of the game, again, uh, for our project, we've been at it since March 2021, so less than uh, less than nine months here, and uh, and we're at a stage where we're ready to to start rolling that out, and uh, that's why we're here is to get the word out and communicate that. Uh, you can expect to see ongoing social media engagement, uh, ongoing ar articles uh, that are being published in, uh, on different uh, organizations and, and publications and ongoing participation from Orange Force Marine and, and, and GLOSE on, on some of these uh, uh, conferences and, and details to get to help get the word out. Thank you, Derek. Um, in the interest of time, we're going to move on to our next speaker. Um, so there are a few more questions in the chat. So if you could um, log in and respond to them there, that would be great. I will do that and, uh, and I'll stop sharing my screen at this point in time. Perfect. So up next, we have um, Robin Beeman. He's a research fellow from James Cook University. Um, and he's gonna give us insight into his efforts to increase the crowdsource bathymetry um, that he's been working on um, through engagement and dive expedition vessels um, and organizations such as, such as Citizens of the Great Barrier Reef for a number of years. Thank you. Thank you, Lyndon. Can you see my screen? Yep. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Robin Beeman. Uh, I'm presenting on crowdsource bathymetry for the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, excuse me, just get this right. Okay, so for this for this talk, uh, uh, we're familiar now. Crowdsource bathymetry is a collection of depth me depth measurements from vessels using stand navigation instruments engaged in routine operations. Uh, within the IHO, the engagement with IHO, uh, the, the idea is that crowdsource bathymetry is collected through a network of trusted nodes. Uh, and for the project that I've been leading, crowdsource bathymetry on the Great Barrier Reef, it is one of these trusted nodes. And I note that uh, there's more trusted nodes being added all the time. So what I want to talk about today is just uh, how we've been doing it on the Great Barrier Reef, how we process it, and eventually make the data public. Straight up, you have to accept that you need funds to do this. We're talking real cash to, to run a crowdsource bathymetry project. Uh, now that could be for paying for loggers or software uh, and you know, paying for technicians and the like, but you do need funds to actually run a project like this. Um, ours is a fairly small and modest project. Uh, we approached the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. We got seed funding of about $10,000 through an innovation fund, and that got us kick-started. So we managed to do quite a lot with that $10,000. As well, it's also important to have uh, a broader uh, umbrella to work within. And uh, we've partnered with uh, Citizens of the Great Barrier Reef, which, which is a non-government organization involved with uh, doing citizen science projects. And we kind of slot in there as part of uh, all the projects that they, uh, they promote and allows us to get uh, a broader uh, exposure to, to the wider community. So having these two together, I think is really important. So starting off with the project, you need to look at what technology you have. Uh, I, I'm really impressed by the, the Great Lakes Observing System and, and where they're going with the Wi-Fi. Uh, for us, though, we started this project back in 2018, and we went with what was uh, what was fairly standard at the time through Team Servers, the company out of the UK, and they'd been operating for some while, and they developed these Team Server loggers. Now they're very, very simple. They're about the size of a mobile phone. Uh, they're powered by 12, 24 volts DC, and they take a, uh, a, a channel uh, uh, connected to a chart plotter. 
they're very reliable. We've been using them uh, for three years now, and we've had virtually no problems with them, although they're sensitive to overvoltage. They, only, they just store the raw NMEA uh, 0183 data strings that come out of the chart plotter. And that's a combination of the GPS position and the echo sounder uh, depth, depth reading. So it's just raw NMEA that's logged to a USB stick. So very simple technology. The sorts of vessels that we're dealing with in the Great Barrier Reef, uh, uh, some examples here. Now at the moment we've only got eight, uh, a fleet of eight, but we're typically talking around 20, 24 uh, meters in length. And these range from dive expedition vessels, uh, fishing vessels. In fact, they're, they're nearly all commercial in some sense. Uh, we, we don't have any just personal recreation vessels and I'll, I'll get to the reason why a bit later. But uh, they're very busy and uh, uh, they, they typically use chart plotters that I uh, think you might be familiar with. You go to any store, uh, any uh, boating fishing store and see similar sorts of chart plotters. So we've used, we've uh, connected with the Garmin's, uh, Fugro's, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Furuno, uh, you know, all the very similar uh, chart plotter types that you can find out there. Uh, the only, the commonality is they all output an enemy 0180, 0183 string. Okay, so installing, um, we've taken the option of getting marine technicians to install. This again is another cost to do. Uh, they need to be mounted in dry sheltered places. Uh, we've, we've learned lots of lessons along the way. We prefer a one channel feed. Uh, we've also found that having a switch or a fuse in place is, is useful. It's a way to kill the power so you can remove the USB stick. Uh, these systems don't like having the USB stick removed while there's power to it. So uh, that's, that's a lesson learned. Uh, as part of the installation, there's also calibration involved. You have to understand that uh, the, the, where the transducer is mounted is, can be quite a distance from where the GPS aerial is measured. So we just use a 30 meter tape to measure the X, Y, Z offsets. The idea being that you come up with a common reference point. Uh, for us, we pick it as the sounder and then we add the difference, which is the waterline. And from there, we know that the depths are from the waterline. Uh, so there's some sort of basic hydrographic um, skills that are, are useful if you're setting up a crowdsource bathymetry project and getting this calibration right at the beginning will save you a lot of headaches down the track. So the fact that this logger only uh, stores raw NMEA strings, you have to do some level of processing. Now there's lots of software out there that allows you to pass or filter uh, the raw NMEA strings into something useful. For us, we just wrote a Python script and it just strips out the uh, latitude, longitude, date, time, course, speed, and depth. If you didn't want to go down that path, then just at the very minimum, you need lat, long, date, time, and of course, depth. Um, for us, we get a report of errors, the valid data points, and the percentage passed for each one of the files that's recorded. We do this very quickly. We typically do it on board the ship when we're there collecting the data so that we can present this data directly to the, uh, to the vessel's owners. And then the next level is some level of spatial filtering. Now that could be done through some specialist hydrographic software, or it can be even as simple as a text, uh, a, a, you know, using a, a, a text software where you do sorting and look for any odd anomalies. Uh, in this case, we have the we have access to both uh, Keras Hips software and also Flattermouse. And uh, ideally, what you want to do is actually put it into a three D point cloud, uh, and that way you can look for visual. Uh, anomalies and the idea is that you could you, know, you can either automatically remove anomalous points or you can manually do it uh, we uh, manually do it uh, it doesn't take too long uh, we generally even without this filtering we find there's very little noise uh, similarly we have very few nav spikes uh, the all these uh, vessels are running on raw gps one thing to note though nearly all of these chart plotters these uh, echo sounder systems are running with uh, a, a set 1500 meters per second. Now that's something that is, needs to be considered if you're dealing with 
you know, typically very warm waters or typically very cold waters that might differ from 1500 meters per second. So just to show you some quick results, we started in 2018 with one vessel. So this is a 3D perspective of the Great Barrier Reef. You're looking at over 2000 kilometers there in that, that view. You can see that white line, that was our first vessel. Uh, 2019 is when we got the funding and we added about uh, four or five more vessels and we quickly realized they are covering an enormous amount of territory. Uh, 2020, another big jump in soundings and then this year uh, we're currently up to 164,000 line kilometers. Now this is from eight vessels, uh, it's quite remarkable. One thing we note is the commercial vessels are really busy, they're out there nearly every day. Uh, recreation vessels may be used, you know, only a fraction of that time. So I would, I would uh, strongly argue that you need to be uh, circumspect about who you partner with, with your volunteer vessels, because it makes all the difference to where they go and how far they travel. Keeping track of vessels is actually quite easy. Um, Bear in mind, we do not have Wi-Fi connectivity here, so we actually have to visit the vessels. Now, actually, personally, I don't mind doing this. I, I really enjoy going on board the ship and uh, speaking with the captains, the, the, the masters about where they've been, where they're going. It's a way of getting feedback from them and vice versa. Uh, we just use uh, marine traffic, and as long as a vessel has uh, some sort of AIS uh, system, uh, you can generally track where they are at any one time. So I can look on marine traffic uh, at the fleet where they are. And if they come into Cairns port, which is close to where I live, um, I usually arrange a time to go and visit. So it's just done very, very casually. So data delivery. Um, this is important. I guess it comes down to what's motivating you. For us, it was around, it was about trying to solve a problem trying to get more bathymetry data to visualize the Great Barrier Reef in 3D. We wanted a comprehensive, uh, realistic 3D perspective of the Great Barrier Reef. And uh, long before uh, CBED 2030 came along, we've been delivering this uh, 3D model of the Great Barrier Reef through my website, which is Deep Reef Explorer, and more recently through the Oz Seabed Marine Data Portal uh, for which Kim Picard from Geoscience Australia will give a talk a little bit later in, in the week. Uh, the other alternative and, uh, and the one that we're working with is the IHO Data Centre for Digital Bathymetry. And of course, this is the what feeds into the CBED 2030 project. It's actually very easy to upload data points. We just, uh, you need some basic metadata, which is around the vessel uh, offsets, uh, and some, I guess, some lineage. There's, there's a, a bit more of expansion going on with metadata through the, the IHO crowdsource bathymetry working group. But nonetheless, uh, the actual file transfer is very easy, and we just put it straight through uh, an FTP transfer. Uh, goes into the the DCDB, and you can actually download the individual data points from those individual vessels. Uh, so just wrapping it up, future work. Uh, of course, we want to add more volunteer vessels, uh, but I think Derek hit on the, the, the real challenge here with scaling up crystal bathymetry is actually to get it off the vessel. And while you manually have to do it, visit the vessel and remove a USB stick, that is quite a bottleneck. So I, I really encourage this whole uh, technology of expanding the technology to do Wi-Fi transfer. Uh, we, that Python script that we use, we're looking at putting it online so that people can actually just drop it on uh, online. We're, we're just in the, the final phases of, of uh, testing that here. So hopefully that'll be available. Again, this is mainly, this is mainly for the team serve type uh, smart loggers that re record this raw NMEA string. Uh, we want to in, upload more of our data to the DCDB we have to get the Australian Hydrographic Office approval to release the, the crowdsource bathymetry data to the public. There's still some, uh, some bureaucratic issues around that. And uh, I guess from our own experiences, just to continue to advise uh, Australian efforts for acquiring crowdsource bathymetry data. 
Uh, and that's the end of my talk and um, I'm very welcome to, to uh, help answer any questions. Over to you, Lyndon. Uh, thank you, Robin. Um, so any questions, please submit them to the chat and I will read them out. Um, in the meantime, I have a question. Do you find that um, your volunteer vessels are really excited about um, helping you out on this project or, you know, more, you know, just kind of mad about it? Like, what are, what are the feelings of um, the captains that you work with? Overwhelmingly positive. I, I guess I, I mentioned I, one of the things I like doing is actually visiting the, the vessels. It's what you'll miss when you go down the Wi-Fi path because people will be collecting data and it'll be just going straight off the ship. I, I think feedback is really important. Uh, so we, we handle this by as soon as we get any data. Now, it could be me visiting the vessel or, in fact, some of the, the vessel owners email them to us. Immediately, we strip the data out. We put it into a 3D uh, view. Uh, we put their data points directly on top of that 3D model. We screenshot it and we send it straight back. Uh, or we do it on the boat. We do it right there in front of them. And there they can actually talk about where they've been, where they're going. This is often an opportunity for us to talk about, you know, where our needs are. But there's always gaps, especially something as large as the Great Barrier Reef, uh, which is the world's largest coral reef ecosystem. Uh, we're, we're trying to find all those nooks and crannies that, that will help us reveal the sea floor in a bit more accuracy. So, uh, yeah, most definitely overwhelmingly positive with, with, with uh, all the captains to the point where they're now, you know, they will go out of their way to go into a gap that we've identified that that should be, uh, you know, we'd like to get some bathy data over. Okay, thank you. Um, and we've had a question from Sheen Tani. Um, how big is the difference of depth where overlap exists? Yeah, that's something that we work, uh, we do a fair bit of work on. Uh, it's particularly when we're talking these, creating these 3D models. Uh, we're fortunate to have quite a lot of uh, Navy or Australian Hydrographic Office survey data. And uh, we, we do straight comparisons. We do that with all our data. Uh, we're generally finding that uh, we're getting within uh, plus or minus about uh, 0.8 of a meter at two sigma level. Uh, so not quite as good as, as what Derek is getting, uh, but when we compare it against, uh, you know, very high quality uh, LIDAR data that's been collected by the Navy, uh, it's falling within the IHO uh, S44 category uh, 1B uh, with minor uh, order two. So, you know, it, it, these are still very, very reasonable results uh, for essentially, you know, just commercial uh, off the shelf uh, chart plotters. That's fantastic. Thank you, Rob. Um, in the interest of time, we're going to move on. So um, I encourage you to monitor the chat for any more questions. And um, up next, we have Commander Christoph Unison. He's the Assistant South African National Hydrographer Maritime Safety Coordinator for the South African National Hydrographic Office. And he will be providing a brief overview of the South African Navy Hydrographic Office Crowdsource Planetary Pilot Project. So take it away. Awesome. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. Um, I'm going to try and keep it nice and brief, but to the point, um, as Lyndon said, I'm the South African um, Assistant National Hydrographer uh, responsible for leading the charge for crowdsource bathymetry, um, not only within South Africa, but also the IHO Southern Africa and Islands Hydrographic Commission um, towards um, CBET 2030. So the aim of my presentation is just I'm going to give um, the viewers or the audience um, a slight overview of what we've been doing, what we've been achieving, um, where the challenges are, and hopefully there's a, a lesson or two that we can all take from this. So South Africa is one of three uh, countries that are participating in a trial uh, for data loggers internationally. 
Um, we have reached an agreement with the IHO through CBIT 2030 uh, for deploying data loggers in South African waters only initially. Um, to assist us or the hydrographic office in, in this regard, we approached the Institute of Maritime Technology in Simonstown um, for their technical partnership and know-how. So the trial concept that we've embarked on um, consists of two parts. Uh, part one is the data collection itself, and then part two is data sharing. So whenever I refer to part one or part two, that's what I'll be referring to. So in terms of data collection, uh, CBET 2030 uh, supplied 100 data loggers to South Africa. Um, this um, was slightly delayed last year because of um, the international um, COVID pandemic that caused um, quite a bit of an upset in terms of getting the loggers into South Africa. Um, and I'm sure as most countries um, have found, um, things slowed down quite a bit last year. Um, as well as the start of this year. So operations only started picking up sort of halfway through this year. So there's been a slight delay, um, but we managed to get all the loggers in, into the country um, and we've, um, we've installed a few as we will see later. So how it would work is the South African Navy Hydrographic Office um, at the Institute for Maritime Technology which is responsible for managing um, the loggers and the data. Now, when I speak of the loggers, you see the picture of the logger there on the right. Um, it is the same type of loggers that we've now already seen uh, this morning or this afternoon. Um, so it's basically the size of a mobile phone with a portable uh, memory device that plugs into it and that can be removed um, in order to, to process the data further. So the installation and the setting to work um, of the units or the data loggers um, on board various vessels of opportunity would be the responsibility for the Institute of Maritime Technology. Obviously, us as the hydrographic office would do the initial liaison, um, introducing the project and establishing the ties, um, and then followed by the IMT technical team to go to the vessels, do a bit of a technical um, inspection to see what is required, if there's any um, supplementary cables, etc., in order to fit the loggers on board. Then the, after the data has been collected, um, the data is checked and then preserved in a central database um, before it is distributed to CBET 2030 community at the hydrographic office. So we check all the data first um, before we make it um, available to JEPCO and CBET 2030. Then we're also focusing on the second part um, of, of this project, which is data sharing. There we are targeting um, the maritime community, um, government, scientific community, the fishing community, um, pretty much anyone that might have hydrographic um, bathymetric data to share that data. So we're looking for existing survey data, whether it is um, in bathymetric data set, whether it is gridded products, uh, whether it is dedicated surveys or oil and gas exploration, engineering sectors, it doesn't matter. Um, what type of data are we looking for? We're pretty much looking for anything that we can get. Um, I'm sure with the target of CBET 2030, um, we can ill afford to be picky um, about the type of data that we get, um, as long as it's good enough to use. So we're looking for low density data sets, um, as well as gridded products, whether it is a large uh, grid or bin sizes or small, um, it doesn't really matter. What we're also accepting at this point in time are polygons of areas um, that has been surveyed um, where data exists, but where the custodian of the data at this point in time, due to various reasons, might not be willing to share it. Um, for example, we've got um, diamond mining off the South African and Namibian coast. Um, we also have extensive offshore fishing communities. Um, and these communities don't necessarily want to, the, the general public to know where they're operating. So at this point in time, they are willing to share where they've got data, but the actual data sets um, still needs to follow through. But at least we know that there is data in that area and that if a dedicated server vessel should become available, we don't have to send it there. So we don't have to duplicate efforts. So in executing the trial, um, the first part that we had to do was to identify um, possible stakeholders um, within South Africa only initially, 
And with the uh, beginning of this year, um, South Africa and the South African Navy Hydrographic Office and myself being the representative was appointed for the Southern African and Islands Hydrographic Commission CBET 2030 or Crowdsource Bathymetry Coordinator. So we expanded um, the project um, outwards to our neighboring countries as well and not only just focusing on our own waters. Um, the biggest part of the legwork was introducing the concept to possible role players um, within South Africa as well as the SIAC. Um, and this is obviously for, for parts one and two, data collection and data sharing. So up until now, we've um, had 28 um, stakeholders that were identified and approach um, of which 25 responded favorably. You'll see that's, that's not a bad percentage of, of good responses, but unfortunately, um, the initial response was good, but from there, um, as things started to become more real, um, if you want to put it for, for lack of a better phrase, um, the stakeholders slowly but surely decreased up until a point where we only had a handful of active participants. We targeted commercial fishing industry, recreational boating, government vessels, including the Navy and research vessels, um, small scale subsistence fishing communities, private sector, and then also, as I said already, site member stage, um, of which um, Seychelles have been um, have contacted us already through the through the United Kingdom Hydrographic Office, and it looks like they might also soon have a um, CBET 2030 project underway. So, as my predecessor already said, uh, Dr. Bowman, um, a working relationship with your stakeholders is absolutely critical. Um, if you do not follow through and do not provide that, that feedback loop, um, you're going to lose stakeholders on the wayside. Um, and at this point in time, we've got 12 active stakeholders, um, of which three of them have actually got the data loggers on board. Um, two is in progress, and then we've got another one of the stakeholders um, that looks like they'll be able to put a data logger on board soon enough. Um, the installation and setting the data loggers um, to work has all been done uh, by IMT staff at this point in time. And as we are now, we currently have five loggers um, installed on board five vessels. Um, the first was one of the um, uh, vessels owned by IMT itself, the Institute for Maritime Technology, where they conduct trials. Then the National Sea Rescue Institute, they are building um, new um, inshore uh, rescue craft. And uh, two of the new vessels were actually fitted with the loggers before they even touched water. So that is good news. Um, and then, of course, our big success story at this point in time is the MV Edinburgh um, that is operated by Ovenstone Agencies. And they conduct um, fishing operations off the island of Tristan de Kuna. And they have um, just recently uh, returned from their first trip with a data logger on board. And we're eagerly awaiting um, to see what the data looks like. So there you can see the vessels. It ranges from relatively small to uh, quite a medium, um, a good size fishing vessel. Um, so these loggers can be fitted on literally on board any vessel um, that's got um, echo sounder as well as uh, GPS on board. Um, on the left, um, you see the actual installation on board one of the NSRI rescue launches. And right between those two blue boxes, you see the black data logger with the orange um, memory stick sticking out of it. So it doesn't take up a lot of space. Um, it's easy to install. Average installation takes about an hour to do um, before the, the vessel is ready to go. So in terms of part two, the actual sharing of information, at this point in time, we've got five active stakeholders that is providing data sets as well as gridded products to the hydrographic office. Um, we've got one stakeholder that has provided polygons of areas that's been surveyed. Um, we've got uh, one stakeholder that's um, in progress. Uh, we are hopefully will be able to seal the deal um, within the next uh, month or two. Um, and then we have got five of the initial stakeholders that we approached that only provided further contact information. And it is actually good to, to take note that although um, stakeholders and partners that you approach might not be able to have vessels that can fit the, the information or actually have uh, data that they can share, they might know somebody else. The maritime community in your local area or in your countries 
Um, they are tight knit communities. They usually know each other pretty well. So reach out, talk to people um, and get some information as to where there are vessels of opportunity available. Um, as Dr. Bowman also said, feedback loop is absolutely critical um, in order to coordinate these various activities, um, as well as identifying challenges and opportunities soon enough and to assist um, your stakeholders in over, over um, gapping um, any, any challenges. Ongoing technical assistance is being provided um, and all our um, active stakeholders that are providing information and that have got uh, loggers on board are being credited on the national, um, the Navy Hydrographic website. Um, we've also been active in inviting the Southern African Island Hydrographic Commission member states, um, as well as the primary charting authorities. Um, as well as a general maritime community to participate in crowdsource bathymetry efforts. And I know internationally there are a couple of IHO member states that is up until this point in time um, not stated whether they will actively participate in crowdsource, crowdsource bathymetry. Um, so one of, the, one of the biggest challenges towards CB2030 and crowdsource bathymetry is actually to get uh, member states involved with crowdsource bathymetry and encourage them to participate um, in this noble project that's also um, supported by the United Nations, undescribed by the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science and Sustainable Development. So what have we achieved thus far? Um, the picture you see there, that is all information that has at this point in time been shared um, to um, the hydrographic office. Um, this is what we've been able to get from our five active um, stakeholders in the last couple of months. You'll see that uh, there's quite a few um, <clears throat> trips that has gone down to Antarctica. That is absolutely critical information. Um, but you see there's, there's, there's quite a lot of area or room for improvement. And um, hopefully we can extend those lines um, towards our east coast and further offshore. Um, unfortunately, in South Africa, most of the vessel traffic around our coastline um, sticks to the coastline itself, and we've got very little offshore um, vessel traffic from us going out there and coming back. So that is a bit of a challenge to us, though. The challenges that we've um, come up with thus far um, is low tentative responses. Um, this is due primarily to commercially sensitive, uh, sensitive information that they don't necessarily want to share. Um, and, there is, and to bridge that, we continue talks and demonstrate what um, information will be in safe custody. Uh, we also have a low first to jump willingness, and hopefully we can use the Edinburgh as a showcase model to convince other participants um, how it works and that your data would actually be, be safe. Then, of course, there's the obvious, the COVID-19 pandemic restrictions of um, quarantined vessel uh, restrictions on travels and meetings, availability, um, etc. Then also lengthy decision-making processes have hampered our, our, um, our efforts thus far, where executive committees take up to months sometimes to come up with a decision on whether they want to participate or not. Um, also, what I've said already, in our context, we've got limited off-the-shelf deployments. Um, so we're looking for any and all vessel traffic based in South Africa that might be going offshore um, to bring back some, some good data. Um, and then, like I also said, there's quite a few member states that's not committed to crowdsource bathymetry yet. Um, and we encourage and invite um, those member states and participants to, to uh, sign up to crowdsource bathymetry and CBET 2030. Then a big opportunity coming up for us, uh, Monaco Explorations will be um, launching an Indian Ocean Expedition next year, uh, where they will be uh, visiting um, quite a few ports um, in the Indian Ocean um, to conduct scientific explorations. Um, the objectives are there on the screen, um, and the hydrographic office um, actively supports this expedition through assistance in planning, as well as the collection of bathymetric data, um, and then also to conduct survey operations with the SI Agalas II, uh, which is our Antarctic research vessel. So with the collaboration of Monaco Explorations, hopefully next year, uh, we'll be able to fill quite a few gaps um, in the Western Indian Ocean um, with this exploration. So this is a very good opportunity for us. 
so just to conclude, um, you can see that seabed 2030 and crosswalls with symmetry is absolutely um, critical. And to make a success of it, we have to collaborate um, and coordinate all our efforts successfully. Um, there's quite a bit of, um, of, of data synthesis and integration that's required. Um, but at the end of the day, hopefully, through all our various efforts, um, we can we can eat this elephant by taking small bites at a time. It's a bit of an African analogy, but it, it applies in this case. Um, but the key here is the sharing of knowledge and data. And we need to all remember that we we're working towards a common goal um, and mutual benefit. Um, so thank you very much for this opportunity and, and hopefully we can make this project um, go forward um, in huge strides. We've got um, just over eight years to go still, so best of luck for everyone. But thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commander Gunnison. That was really interesting. Um, we've had a few comments and questions come in, um, but I'm going to encourage, encourage you to um, look at the chat. We're running a bit behind. I want to make sure everybody has time to get back to their busy schedules. So up yep. next, thank you. And rounding things out, we have Dr. Brian Calder um, from the University of New Hampshire Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping. Um, and he will discuss his inexpensive volunteer um, observer bathymetric data collection systems um, for swarm deployment in underserved, undermapped areas of the world. Thank you, Lyndon. Just to confirm you can see the presentation and uh, correctly? Yep, we're all good. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh -oh. there we go. All right, so this, uh, this work that I'm going to talk to you about today uh, came about almost by accident. I was asked uh, a while ago now to look into the available data loggers that could be used to collect volunteer data. And uh, particularly with respect to the project you just heard about in South Africa and another couple around the globe. Uh, we looked at all of the <coughs> available data loggers, both for NEMA 2000 and for NEMA 183, you know, scattering of them are, are shown here, and uh, made recommendations which went on to be used for uh, developing the projects. But uh, as I was looking at these loggers, you know, as, as you know, anybody who does any engineering will tell you, when you look at something like this, the, the, you start thinking, well, do they have to be like that? I mean, is that really what they should look like? And particularly, should that, is that what they really should cost? Um, these All of these loggers that you can see here are typically on the order of about $250 US or 250 euros um, to, to buy and install. As we've seen in a couple of the presentations in this session, if you don't have density of data, there's a limitation to what you can do with this data in terms of the, the accuracy and precision of the data uh, and, and therefore its utility. And if your data loggers are $250 each, then there's a limit to how many that you can actually deploy. Uh, if I wanted to deploy 100 of these, that's a significant chunk of change. And what that means is that there's a significant uh, barrier to entry if people want to undertake a project like this themselves. And so the question I ended up asking myself is, what is the minimal cost and minimal functionality system that we could deploy which would allow us to collect volunteer bathymetric information or BBI? Uh, but to think about this as a, a system rather than just uh, an individual item. Um, is, this is, as we've heard from the last couple of presentations, this is more than just about the hardware. It's also about the system that goes around it, the software and infrastructure that go with it as well. And so the question is, what is the minimum possible case that we could put together for all of these things to make a functioning system? At the same time, we have to think about also the context in which we do this work. In looking at other work, and particularly on observer reputation, uh, which we just have published in IHR recently, if you look at the sort of data that you get in these international databases, in this case from the area around Seattle, Washington, uh, which is one of the denser areas that's there, the density of the data really isn't that great. Um, if you look at the data just as a set of points, it looks okay, but what you have to remember is that any data point has to be at least one pixel, and if the pixels are large, it looks a lot better than it actually is. If you actually compute the data density, which is the plot on the right here, you get a, a limited number of areas where there's lots of data density. In this case, it's because of vessel um, ferry traffic going across Puget Sound. 
But everywhere else, there's very little data. And if you're going to try and make any estimates of depth from that, that means there's a very significant limitation to what you can do. Um, I, I tend to refer to this sort of thing as volunteer bathymetry rather than crowdsource, because a crowd implies that you have multiple people making the same measurements. And quite often, we just don't have that in the sort of the mathematic world that we're looking at. And that's a problem. And so that brings about the second question that we wanted to try and think about was, what's the concept of operations that we should be thinking about here? How should we deploy these systems to give us the best possible effect? How do we distribute these systems? How do we support them? How do we operate them? And we've heard about a couple of different models in the session so far, but I wasn't convinced that we had come up with the right models. So I wanted to try and take this very holistic view to this and look at not only the hardware piece and the software that goes along with it, but how we operate these models as well. Um, particularly because what I'm interested in here is not making one project. I don't want to be in charge of running a volunteer bathymetry project. I'm, I'm a researcher, I'm paid to do research, not to run projects like that. What I want to do though, is I want to enable people to carry out these projects so that if, for example, South Africa comes to us and says, hey, we'd like to be able to collect some bathymetric data, or the Yacht Club of Monaco comes to us and said, hey, you know, we've got a lot of people that, that have yachts here, some of them are very nice yachts here, we would like to have a better map of the area off the coast or the local yacht club down the street here comes to us and says, I want to be able to enable them to collect the data, but at the same time, make it easy for them to collect the data, to take away those barriers to entry, to make it simple, to make it frictionless effectively, so that anybody who wants to collect this data can collect the data, but at the same time, preserve the option to make sure that that data makes it into the international databases given local requirements, as we just heard uh, Commander Tennyson talk about. So our general design principles for this project were to try and think about something that could be modular and portable, so that it's something that can be cloned. And that's the key to scale. We don't want a single project. What we want is the model for how projects happen, so that we can implant those projects in different locations around the globe and therefore get to much bigger scale of collection rather than just having small individual project collections. We also want them to be independent. This has to be something that people can do themselves and to take in as many possible data streams as we, we can so that we can collect as much data as we can. We also want it to be frictionless. I talk about the concept of frictionless operations. The more I ask participants to do, the less likely it is the participants will do it. Um, so I want it to be as simple as possible for people to use this technology, to get it, to have control of it themselves, to feel that they can have ownership of what it is that they're doing. It's their data. I want them to have the control over that data. So we want minimal data collector interaction. We want it to be as simple as possible for people to use. What that means, though, is that we have to think about automated methods for doing things, automated data transfer and processing and how we support that in a distributed fashion, in a scalable fashion. But what that also means is that we, we are thinking of this in terms of having a local support person. So like IMT in the South African context, where there is somebody there who's, or, or Dr. Beeman in the, the, the Australian Great Barrier Reef context, there's somebody there whose job it is to look after these systems, to interact with the, the captains, to keep the crowd. Recruiting your volunteers is hard work, Keeping your volunteers is also hard work, and both are important if you're going to be successful in a project like this. And finally, we want it to be cost effective. This has to be something that we can effectively give away for free. We want it to be scalable, and that means that if our loggers cost $250 each, they're really not scalable. Um, we want them to be as cheap as we can possibly make them. I, I prefer inexpensive because cheap makes it sound like they're, it's not good. <laughs> so inexpensive as possible. But we also want the generic software that can be repurposed. So you've heard people talk about becoming a trusted node. It's actually quite a, an involved process. I want to provide the software so that people can become a trusted node with as little effort as possible. And that, of course, implies that everything has to be open and we, we're not going to charge any fees for it. So everything I'm about to talk about is open source or open hardware. So in terms of what we've developed based on these general design principles, this is the logger. Uh, if you can still see my, my video, I'm holding up 
um, the physical example, so you can get a sense of scale with respect to my hand there. It's about the size of a, a, an ordinary credit card, more or less. We call this the, the wireless inexpensive bathymetry logger or Wibble. And it's designed to be as, as uh, accepting of data streams as possible. So it has a, a NEMA 183 interface on the left hand side there that's fully opto isolated so it can connect to uh, networks. It actually transmits as well as receives, which means that you can use this as a data simulator too, which is great for testing. Um, it also saved our bacon on our project. We were able to have it transmit to itself because that was the only way we could get to our data. Um, it also has a NEMA 2000 interface on the right hand side there, uh, which is a fairly straightforward interface to do, um, although you wouldn't know that from the, the price of the connectors that you, <laughs> you get charged for. It has a, a small motion sensor here, which is it's a six degree of freedom, so it has three axes of acceleration, three axes of gyro. Um, these things are designed for mobile phones, mobile devices, so their, their quality is not great, but we're hopeful that, that will give us some uh, motion uh, information that we can use to our advantage without having to uh, pay for a very expensive motion sensor. Uh, we collect data onto a simple SD card. Um, the, the system that we're looking at right now has a six gigabyte card. Based on our experience, we expect that to last at least six months in standard operation, possibly up to a year, depending on how much data your system is uh, generating and how, how much you filter that data, uh, which you can do on the firmware of this logger. The heart of the logger is that this little microcontroller here is made by a company called Espressive. Um, this uh, is a dual core 240 megahertz system, so it's actually pretty powerful. The key thing here, though, is it has all the peripherals on board that are required to run the NEMA 2000 interface, the NEMA 183 interface, to talk to the motion sensor, to talk at high speed to the data uh, store in the SD card. And it will also do both Bluetooth and Wi Fi. And so everything you need to talk to the logger is built into that uh, little module there. And it's already gone through all the FCC certification issues that, that would be problematic otherwise. And the last piece is a, 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 a power management system to make it less susceptible to those sorts of power fluctuations that uh, Rob was talking about earlier. Um, and we also have a little bit of emergency power on here. We have a supercapacitor on here that stores enough for about a half a second's worth of power when the main power goes out. And that lets us shut everything down cleanly so we don't have those same sort of problems that we heard about where you pull the power and try to take out the card and it causes all sorts of problems. In fact, we don't actually have to take out the card because the way we get data off is via Wi-Fi instead of having to physically touch the card. Um, at volume, these things are not terribly expensive. The last batch we had made, uh, we had made in smaller batches, which makes them a little bit more expensive, but the pricing such, is such that if you make them in batches of about 50, which would be small, they cost order about $10 each. Um, and uh, they, um, they are, they get cheaper the more of them you make because the uh, engineering costs tend to go down the more of the more of these that you make. Of course, you'd pay a little bit more because you'd pay for uh, some connectors in the box and everything else. So maybe if you double that number, that's a, a reasonable value. We could optimize it by cutting out one of these interfaces. So we could do it just NEMA 183 or just NEMA 2000. So there are various options in there, but the point is uh, more than an order of magnitude cheaper than the current state of the, the art for these sorts of loggers, which allows us then to scale in ways that we wouldn't be able to scale otherwise. Now, I mentioned that I was thinking about this as ter in terms of a system. This is an outline for what we see as the concept of operations. The idea is that we have these data loggers be cheap enough, we can basically give them away. Or, so for example, a project uh, can make them very cheaply. Either they can get them from another source or they can make them themselves. We actually provide all the information you need to make these yourself. Um, but you also have a, a data flow path here for uh, how the data gets from the, uh, the loggers themselves all the way into the processing. The, the basic idea is that you will have um, the, uh, a local support personnel that, that will go out to the boats and collect the data. And they have a, a mobile device through which they can extract the data from the logger. So you don't have to physically touch the logger. You don't have to take a memory stick out or anything like that. You just walk up, use Bluetooth to turn the logger on, connect to the Wi-Fi, and then pull the data off directly there. That data is then sent straight through the cloud, uh, straight through Amazon Web Services into 
a data bucket, and so it immediately starts into its processing chain. The processing chain is also cloud-based, um, and it's broken into a set of what we call Lambdas. Um, it's a, a particular service that Amazon provides. And uh, two stages right now. Uh, so the first stage is that it takes the data and it does unpacks it, does timestamping, converts it into an appropriate format for processing. We then store that intermediate data in case you want to do any further work with it. And then there's a second stage where we do handshake with DCDB and upload the data into DCDB and we apply all the appropriate metadata and so on so that it's correctly formatted when it gets to the database. Now, not everybody is going to want to do the same type of um, processing with uh, this, this data. Some people might want to do a project where they just pass the data through as quickly as possible. Others might want to inspect it first, as we heard in a couple of the projects. So these, these lambdas are designed to be modular. So you can abstract out the, the, the lambdas uh, and you can reformat the structure. We provide all the software for the standard processing method, but if you wanted to add your own, that's, that's fine. I actually have a, a team of four uh, computer science undergraduate students working on their senior project with me right now, looking at uh, exactly this, where they're working on ways to make this much more flexible. So they are working on a system where you can uh, put in your own processing, for example, if you wanted to tee out a data stream or you wanted to aggregate all your data or you wanted to compute uncertainties or observer reputations or whatever else, you do all that. And the loggers are designed so that what the data needs to have happen to it is encoded in the logger. So in the data stream that comes out of the logger, it will say, for this data, you need to run algorithm A, B or C. Uh, and then once that gets to the cloud, it can detect that, it can read it out the data files, and then work out what processing needs to be done. You can also embed into the loggers uh, the metadata for the ships. So things like offsets, for example, um, anything else that you want to add as extra information, the size of the ship, the ship identification, so on and so forth, again, gets embedded into the logger. So it's individual. And we don't keep track of it centrally. It can happen in a distributed fashion, so it's scalable as well. Um, the first use of these loggers, um, I took one uh, that was this year, or last year now actually, um, we, or rather, sorry, earlier this year now, starting to run together through the pandemic, we took them out on the US Coast Guard Cutter Healy, and so we went through the Northwest Passage from uh, west to east, from Alaska and ended up in Greenland, and collected data along the way there uh, with the, the demonstration logger uh, in the red line that you can see there. This is an example of the data and you're, you're seeing the whole thing. So it's, it's quite compacted, but the data was collected regularly, roughly once a second. Um, although the depths didn't change that often because we were in deeper water much of the time. Uh, you can see the data is a little bit noisy. Uh, that's because we're breaking ice. It, you know, there's a lot of ice in that area there. So there's, uh, you know, like any other data, it has problems there. But as you can see, we have data down to quite deep uh, regions in here as we went out into the uh, deeper part uh, uh, of the straits between uh, Canada and Greenland. Uh, many echo sounders won't be able to do this, uh, and that's simply because they just don't go deep enough. What you're looking at here is actually the center beam from a multi beam, and therefore we can go to arbitrary depth for this particular system. It's a 12 kilohertz system, so we can go to full ocean depth if we had to. Uh, the, so the data is, is readily collectible. This data is now staged. We're just about to send it to DCDB. I'm just waiting for a final confirmation of metadata structure from them to make sure that what we're sending them they can use. And then that'll go out probably this week. Uh, we also collect, of course, uh, motion data. This is an example of the motion data, three axes of acceleration, three axes of gyro. Uh, like I said, the, the, the data quality is not great. Um, because it's a, you know, the chip is four millimeters on a side and it's designed for mobile phones. But we're hopeful that uh, we may be able to get something out of that and use it for helping us to correct the data, uh, which most of the loggers just don't do currently. Um, and so we're, we're, I have graduate students working on this. Hopefully we'll get that in the future. Just to reiterate, remember this is something which I want to be able to be scalable to everybody. And that means that we're making everything as much available as we possibly can, which is we are making, for example, all the, the architectural diagrams for the, the circuitry available, the uh, how you make the printed circuit board layout is also available, the bill of materials and the pick and place spell that you use to manufacture these are all available, as is all of the software for the logger itself and all of the software for the data processing. And it's all wrapped up 
in uh, a free, publicly available uh, open source uh, repository that you can get with the command that you can see at the bottom of the screen there. The, wiki, the repository also has a wiki attached that has lots of details about how to set these things up and the history of the project and the design decisions that were made into it as well. So we're very much hoping that this is something which will become, as we hope, scalable so that people could clone this themselves and uh, make their own projects. Always with that path, make sure the data comes back into DCDB. But there are many ways that you can ring the changes on that. For example, it could be that one person wants to buy the loggers rather than make them and a third party is willing to make them for them. We're actually working with our industrial partners right now to do that. So there is a commercial logger that you could just buy instead of having to make yourself. Um, also, you could do, you could mix up the software. You could have your own version of the software that does whatever you want it to do because you have ownership of it. Um, or you could say, well, I don't want to have to deal with the cloud piece, but I'll get somebody else to deal with the cloud piece and I'll send my data to them instead because there's a standard interface, because everybody's using the same sort of technology. So that's our, that's our general hope. Um, I'll leave contact details up here, but in the meantime, I know we're over time, so I will happily take uh, questions, or if anybody wants to contact me afterwards, I'm happy to answer questions on the project afterwards too. Thank you, Bart. Fantastic. Thank you, Brian. That was really interesting. Um, let's see if we've had any questions come in. Um, in the meantime, I have a question for you. I'm wondering um, about the app that downloads the data. Is that something that we could make publicly available? That it's, it's vessels, in a, captains it, it, could send the data themselves or? Exactly, yeah. So my team of four undergraduate uh, computer science students are actually working right now on uh, a new version of that app. It's actually in a repository as well. So it's a pub again, publicly available. You can get to it directly and look at it yourself. What they're doing right now is they're doing um, a version which will allow them to do from the same source base an iOS app and an Android app. So you'd be able to put it on pretty much anything and then use it uh, to do the download. So if the, the vessel captains wanted to see their own data and download their own data, they'd certainly be able to. The main purpose though is for the local support person to take the data off and make sure it goes up into the cloud. But if they want to look at it locally, that's fine. The other thing to mention is that the, the most of the heart of this logger uh, is in the software rather than the hardware. The hardware is actually pretty straightforward. It's the firmware that makes it special. And because it has the functionalities for Wi-Fi and everything else, if you wanted to, our concept of operation is not to do this, but this little logger here can connect up to somebody else's Wi-Fi as well. So if you had a Wi-Fi system on board that had connection to shore, you could connect us to it as well and do real-time updates if you wanted to, um, or use it as a bridge. So you could have the NEMA data arriving and have it broadcast on the Wi-Fi as well, or vice versa. So you can use it as a bridge either way. The only thing that would change is the firmware. We actually have examples of some of that in the repository as well. So we see it as, you know, we're making this available and we have an idea in mind of how it should be used. But there are, there's much more you could do with it as well. And we're hoping that other people will innovate on top of what we're doing is, is the, the hope generally with any open source project. Thank you. That's really cool. Um, so we've had one comment come in um, from I'm Dr. I'm going to stop sharing here just now so I can see the comments as well. Yeah. Um, he just says, excellent work, Brian and team. A step change in CSB BBI technology. Oh, thank you, Rob. That's very kind. Um, I haven't seen any more questions come in. So we might be able to end here today. I know people are busy and we've gone over time. So yeah. please 